Well, hello, Woodman Valley Chapel. My name is Lindsay, and I'm on staff here at the Rock Redman campus. And we are just so thrilled that you have come to worship with us today. We recognize that you could be a lot of places right now, at home, underneath a blanket, staying warm. But we are so glad that you have made the decision to be here today. And because you've made the decision to be here today, we would actually love the opportunity to step towards you and get to know you better. And the best place we can do that at is at Connect Central. So if you head out these inner doors, down the hallway to the left, you're gonna find a group of people who would love to talk to you, get to know you a bit, and answer any questions that you might have. And you might be thinking, I'm not a visitor. I don't have to go to Connect Central. Wrong again. You can always go to Connect Central to find ways to get more involved here at Woodman. And one of those ways that you can get involved is coming up on October 5th. It is our Fall City Serve Day. And it is a great day that we can go out into our community and love them through service projects. So Woodman Valley joins with an organization called Cuz I Love You and dozens of churches across the city to go out into organizations and schools and get some stuff done to show them that we care. And so you can sign up with your family, you can sign up with your community group, you can lean over to the person sitting next to you in the pew and say, let's do this. Or if you are an extrovert, you can go by yourself and make new friends. But we hope that you guys take advantage of this opportunity to love our city. Another way that you can love our city is through our Feeding Families program. There are a lot of families in the Pikes Peak region who struggle with food insecurity. And our Feeding Families program comes alongside them to help alleviate that burden. Every week, uh, we provide meals and snacks for over 300 families, which is quite amazing. And we can only do that because you guys are so faithful to donate items. So when you're coming into the building, you'll always see the feeding family bins by the doors, or you can go online and find our Amazon wish list and order some items and it gets shipped straight to our pantry. So you can find, about, find more about the feeding families or CityServe by scanning that little QR code right there in the pew back and pulling up the weekend service guide. It is great that we have opportunities to love our city, but we can love well because it's God who has first loved us. And he is working in big and small ways to bring about his kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. And for that, we can praise his name. And so if you can at this time, why don't we stand and worship our Lord together?
before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. Almighty fortress, you go before. Oh
take it for granted. God, I thank you for every soul in this building tonight. Be with us, speak to us, and may we be prepared for what our Father in heaven has to share, to teach. God, we praise you. 
for the merciful, all-powerful God that you are. The one who comes down and spends time with us knows every detail of us, God. We thank you for loving us so deeply. We ask that you be with us now as we open your word. May we have hearts that are ready to hear from our God. God, be glorified by our singing, by our reading, by our encouraging of one another, and be glorified by the tithes and offerings that we give back to you, Jesus. We praise you, we thank you for all these things. It's in your name we we pray. And the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. The Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Well, hello, Woodman. So the Apostle Paul, in his first letter to the Corinthians, he he began by reminding them that God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are. And one of the most powerful illustrations of that truth, apart from the Corinthians themselves, is the passage that we are going to turn to this weekend. It is certainly the most famous passage in 1 Samuel, and arguably one of the most well-known passages in Scripture. Even among... The biblically illiterate, the story of David and Goliath, has been used to describe any person or group who overcomes overwhelming odds to prevail. Among the faithful, however, it is at times twisted to communicate something beyond what I think the writer intended. And it is also long. So we are going to jump right in. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this story that is most likely well known to the majority of us. And I pray, God, that that familiarity does not cause us to tune out but that you would give us ears to hear. Help me not to make any mistakes and be glorified in your church. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, turn, if you would, to 1 Samuel chapter 17. We're going to begin at verse 1. And if you're new, uh, my name's Josh. I'm one of the pastors here. But if, if you're new to church stuff in general, you need to know that the passage before us is, is a really special one in 1 Samuel. Uh, We refer to it as a narrative in that the author is recording for us the details of events as they happened. And, And it's one that the author who records it wanted to stick in people's memory. So he gives an awful lot of detail. Now, it's not like Lord of the Rings level long, but we probably could have split it up into smaller sections and addressed it over several weeks. But when you do that, you do lose a little bit of the arc of the story. All that to say, I will be reading longer chunks of scripture than we may be used to. 
which means if you love story time as a kid, you're going to love this. It begins by introducing us to the enemy. Verse 1. Now the Philistines gathered their armies for battle, and they were gathered at Soko, which belongs to Judah, and encamped between Soko and Azekah in Ephes Damim. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered and encamped in the valley of Elah, and drew up in line of battle against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on the mountain on the one side, and Israel stood on the mountain on the other side, with a valley between them. Now, if you have a penchant for geography, you like coloring the maps, this is on the western edge of Judah. It's about 15 miles west of Bethlehem. And you have the Philistines and the Israelites, each on their own mountain, with a valley in between them. And verse 4 says, And there came out of the camp of the Philistines a champion named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits in a span. He had a helmet of bronze on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. And he had a bronze armor on his legs, and a javelin of bronze slung between his shoulders. The shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron, and his shield bearer went before him. Now, I'll tell you, nowhere, nowhere in Scripture do you find a more detailed description of a soldier and his attire. And what is described here is surely to be terrifying. Now, the word champion is literally a man between the two. And it apparently referred to uh, a thing the Philistines like to do in battle in which they would pick a representative. Instead of having two armies go at it, each sustaining massive loss of life, uh, they would choose someone to fight for them. And the two from each side, one from each side rather, would fight to the death, and whoever prevailed... That side would be declared the winners. Now, it is not something that the Israelites ever did in battle. And, and you wonder if they could have just said, um, no, we're, we're just all going to come at you. But, but they probably didn't elect to do that. Because if they did, at least one of them would have to have fought Goliath. And he was terrifying. Six cubits and a span would make him nine foot nine. Now the Greek translation of the Old Testament, obviously coming subsequent, it recorded his height as six foot nine. But even still, he would have towered over the Israelites, who, while not hobbits, were not regarded for their height. And he had a bronze helmet. His armor weighed the equivalent of 126 pounds. He had armor on his legs. He had a javelin of bronze. He had a sword. And he had a spear with a 15-pound metal point. The combination of his size, his armor, and his weapons would have made him appear to be invincible. And what's more, Goliath knew it, and he had a mouth on him. Verse 8 says, he stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, why have you come out to draw up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? And are you not servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, I defy 
the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistines, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. This is trash talk at its most ancient. <laughs> he begins by saying, hey, why, why'd you all line up to fight up there? You're all lined up to fight, but no one's, no one's coming to fight me. So let, let's make a deal. You send one and I'll stand here. If, if you guys win, oh, we, we, we will all be your servants. But, but if I win, you be ours. The author points out that Saul himself was dismayed and greatly afraid. Probably because we know Saul was the tallest Israelite they had. And as king would have seemed like perhaps the most natural choice to fight him. Now the question is, why did the author spend so much time giving us these details about Goliath? And I think the reason being, chances are, he'd, he'd been fishing with buddies before. He was well aware of our propensity to exaggerate. But he wants us to know that Goliath was huge. He was armed to the teeth. And, and he was terrifying. No exaggeration. Now what is odd is what we as Christians, some of us, have done with this incredible detail. Many of us use Goliath as sort of a synonym, a representative of any big opposition we face. And in that way, we're not all that different than Lucky Day in the classic film Three Amigos. A film which is not endorsed by Woodman or its elders, if for no other reason than its dramatic overuse of cultural stereotypes, but in the film, a town is threatened by a bandit named El Guapo. And Lucky Day, played by the great Steve Martin, is looking to rally the crowd to fight. And he says, someday, the people of this village will have to face El Guapo. We might as well do it now. In a way, all of us have an El Guapo to face someday. For some, shyness may be their El Guapo. For others, a lack of education may be their El Guapo. For us, El Guapo is a big dangerous guy who wants to kill us. But as sure as my name is Lucky Day, we can conquer our own personal El Guapo, who also happens to be the actual El Guapo. <laughs> Too many people, they do the same thing with Goliath. We even sing it, right? I may not face Goliath, but I've got my own giants. And the thing is, we don't always do that with other literal parts of Scripture. Right? We, don't, we don't read of Balaam and his talking donkey and then think to ourselves, if I'm ever headed into danger, I can count on my dog speaking up to tell me. No, the author, the author is actually really trying to defend the Israelites here. He's trying to defend the terror they feel. And he's acknowledging it's warranted. Goliath really did appear to be invincible. The most accurate comparison we could make is not that Goliath represents an addiction or some besetting sin or great earthly enemy. The most accurate comparison would be death itself. There's no escaping it. There's nothing we can do. Death comes for us all, and apart from Jesus, it is terrifying. What the author does next is set up the backstory of our protagonist, and he goes into about as much detail to describe him as he did Goliath. But our protagonist couldn't be any more opposite. He's just a lowly shepherd. 
We read in verse 12. Now David was the son of an Ephrathite of Bethlehem in Judah, named Jesse, who had eight sons. In the days of Saul, the man was already old and advanced in years. The three oldest sons of Jesse had followed Saul to battle. And the names of his three sons who went to the battle were Eliab, the firstborn, next to him, Abinadab, and the third, Shammah. David was the youngest. The three eldest followed Saul, but David went back and forth from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. For 40 days, the Philistine came forward and took his stand morning and evening. And Jesse said to David, his son, take for your brothers an ephah of this parched grain and these 10 loaves and carry them quickly to the camp to your brothers. Also take 10 cheeses to the commander of their thousand. See if your brothers are well and bring some token from them. Now Saul and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. And David rose early in the morning and left the sheep with the keeper and took the provisions and went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the encampment as the host was going out to the battle line shouting the war cry. And Israel and the Philistines drew up for battle, army against army. And David left the things in charge of the keeper of the baggage and ran to the ranks and went and greeted his brothers. Now we're introduced to David as if we've never heard about him before. However, we already know that Dave had been serving some in Saul's court, playing tunes when the king was tormented, and having great success. So why all this detail? Well, at least two reasons. One, I think, was to set the record straight, lest we get the wrong idea from the passage before this. David was still a young man. He had to be 20 years old to serve full-time in the military, and David was not yet that. But two, I think he did it so that this, this story could serve as a trailer for the entire book. I mean, if you were asked to go and read this story to like a group of third graders, you could read just chapter 17 and not have to deal with anything that came before it. And what does it reveal? Well, it tells us that David was a lot more like Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer than he was like Comet, Cupid, Donner, or Blitzen. His older brothers were off at war, and David was still at home. He was still taking orders from his dad. He was still doing the menial job of looking after the sheep. He was still being sent on errands when his father didn't want to drive. Now, knowing how the story goes, as most of us do, David is an example of what Paul was saying to the Corinthians. He told them, not many of you were wise, not many of you were powerful, not many of you were of noble birth. To the contrary, you were foolish, weak, low, and despised. But God chose you. And that is something, I think, we can apply to our lives. You may not have what others hold dear. You may not have the pedigree or the social status that others do, but that in no way limits your usefulness to God. If anything, it may actually make you more attractive because as God does remarkable things through you, it is him that would certainly get the glory for it. Now what is depressing about our passage is that it may not be David we have most in common with, but rather those who are around him. We see next fear and opposition. Verse 23 says, as he talked with them, behold, the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, came out of the ranks of the Philistines and spoke the same words as before. And David heard him. All the men of Israel, when they saw the men, fled from him and were much afraid. And the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel. And the king will enrich the man who kills him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. 
Goliath had been coming out every day for 40 days, taunting the Israelites, issuing his threat, and then going back to camp. And it just so happens that David arrives at the front at the very time Goliath is coming forward and making his regular appearance. And what is it that David hears the mighty army of Israel say in response? They're terrified. They're scared out of their minds. They they, they start running away, even though Goliath is still a great distance away. And even the promise of incredible compensation Saul says, I will make you rich. Saul says, I will give you my daughter's hand in marriage. Saul tells them that your entire family will be exempt from all federal and state taxes forever. And even all of that does not motivate even one to stand forward and take on Goliath. You would like to think that David, this young Israelite, would have heard something else. And I will tell you, the children and the students in our church, they they need to hear something very different. There there are really few things that frustrate me more than, than, than hearing someone, oftentimes older, say that they they really feel bad for kids these days. And if you press them and you ask why, they got a variety of reasons. I mean, this world's going the wrong way. We're going to lose our country. What chance do they have? Let me tell you something. The followers of Jesus have been born in a world going the wrong way for centuries now. And what the youth of today need is not fear of the future. They need grandma and grandpa speaking faith. They need grandma and grandma telling them that that it doesn't matter what you see, our God is sovereign. They need grandma and grandpa telling them, even if... It gets worse than we could imagine. Even if you face persecution and pay the ultimate price. I'm a little jealous and couldn't be more proud. Students need to hear faith and hope from the generation that goes before them. They don't need to hear fear And unfortunately, that is not all that was being peddled that day. But outright opposition, verse 26 says, And David said to the men who stood by him, What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him in the same way, So shall it be done to the man who kills him. I mean, it's incredibly sassy for a young boy from the field to say. He goes, what shall be done for the man who kills the Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? As in, I think David's saying, he's not looking like, hey, what's the reward? I might be interested. He's saying, what do you you mean? What's to be done? The guy that gets to take the reproach away, that's reward enough. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should step to the armies of the living God but it totally goes over their head. They just keep telling everybody, hey, there's a great reward, there's a great reward. You you should do it, You you should go. But his eldest brother, Eliab, he's heard enough. Verse 28 says, now Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men. And Eliab's anger was kindled against David. And he said, why have you come down? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? 
I know your presumption and the evil of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. And David said, what have I done now? Was it not but a word? And he had turned away from him toward another and spoke in the same way. And the people answered him again as before. Now maybe, maybe it's because it still stung a little bit. The memory of Eliab walking up to Samuel and a big smile coming across Samuel's face only for God to say, no, that's not the guy. Maybe it's because here's a lie with all his soldier buddies and then his youngest kid brother, the smallest one, is coming around and running his mouth. Whatever it was, Eliab tears into David. Why are you here? Who's with the sheep? Are you trying to like cook up a little story for Instagram, make yourself look all tough on the front? And what's wild is, as can happen in families, right, it almost sounds like this wasn't the first time Eliab had ripped into him. Because David actually says, what have I done this time? But to David's credit, he pays Eliab no attention, and he just keeps walking around trying to rally the crowd. Look, I will be the first to admit As a father of three sons, I mean, they've said some crazy stuff in the past. I know for a fact that two of my three sons would love to play in the NFL. And as a father, I always want to try to be encouraging, but like my wrists are the size of like a baby fawn's leg. (laughs) It's just not in the cards for you, kid. I want to be encouraging. It's just not happening. God's given us other gifts. But when our children or the students in our church talk about standing up for God, doing something for the fame of his name, we should not be the ones opposing them or keeping them down. We should be the first to get in their corner. And students, I cannot speak for every home you come from. But I can tell you, this church, this church is behind you. This is a place that wants to support you. It's a church that wants to pray for you. It's a church that wants to give money so that you can engage in ministry that matters. And I'll also say, many of you students, the ones that I know, you are doing an incredible job. Continue to impress us. Now, what gave David his moxie? Well, he had an informed faith. Look at verse 31. When the words that David spoke were heard, they repeated them before Saul, and he sent for him. And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight this Philistine. And Saul said to David, you are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are but a youth, and he's been a man of war from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant used to keep sheep for his father, and when there came a lion or a bear and took a lamb from the flock, I went after him. I struck him and delivered it out of his mouth. And if he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and struck him and killed him. Your servant has struck down both lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them, for he has defied the armies of the living God. And David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand, the paw of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. Then Saul clothed David with his armor. He put a helmet of bronze on his head, clothed him with a coat of mail. And David strapped his sword over his armor. And he tried in vain to go, for he had not tested them. Then David said to Saul, I I cannot go with these, for I have not tested them. So David put them off. This is truly remarkable. Because if you were here and you recall that when Samuel went to anoint the sons of Jesse... He first assumed it was the eldest brother, Eliab. 
But God told him to not look on his appearance or the height of his stature. And here, David appears to have already received that memo. Uh, Goliath's height, Goliath's armor, the big stinking spear meant nothing to David. He's like, I've dealt with beasts before. I've killed bears and lions. This is no different. I'll take this beast out too. And Saul relents, happy probably just to have someone break the stalemate, tries to put him in his own armor so he can be like, yeah, I helped. He says, Lord be with you. Probably like, really, like I hope the Lord's with you. (laughs) Now, if you are of the personal conviction that the story of David and Goliath was written to encourage you to slay your own personal El Guapo, then you should probably take to heart what's gotten David to this point. David did not begin with Goliath. He began walking with God and growing his faith, and he had been doing that for some time. And if you want to slay something big, you should do the same. Like David, start with routine faithfulness. David knew God's word. David was a man of prayer. Be faithful with the little things. Be the man or woman God wants you to be, especially when no one is looking. David here was not making some flippant decision. David was not rolling the die and really hope it worked out. He had seen God work before and was confident that he could do it again. And if you want to see God work in the big things, try him first out on the small. And here's the thing. David, David was right. The Lord saves. Verse 40 says, Then he took his staff in his hand and chose five smooth stones from the brook and put them in his shepherd's pouch. His sling was in his hand, and he approached the Philistine. And the Philistine moved forward and came near to David with his shield bearer in front of him. And when the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth, ruddy and handsome in appearance. And the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Then the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. David tells Saul, I got this. And he goes and he grabs five smooth stones, probably each one being about the size of a tennis ball. And he approaches Goliath, and Goliath is offended. He he is the champion of the Philistines. And some kid comes out to meet him. Hardly the thing that's going to elevate Goliath's reputation, killing a handsome little guy. It's beneath him. And from Goliath's vantage, six to nine feet up, it looks like David is carrying like a little stick. And he probably did not realize it. But Goliath said the wrong thing. He curses David by his gods, which any Israelite familiar with God's word would know that God had specifically told 
their father Abraham, that he would bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you, I will curse. Goliath didn't recognize it, but he had just signed his own death warrant, calling upon his gods. He invoked the wrath of David's. Verse 45 says, Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. And I will give the dead bodies of the hosts of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and that all this assembly may know that the Lord saves, not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hand. David throws it down. He says, you come to me with your sword, spear, and javelin, but you know what? God made my stick. (laughs) And notice, notice what David's motivation is. It's not that he wants that reward. No, he, he wants all the earth to know that there is a God in Israel. He wants all the jokers standing behind him that God doesn't save with sword and spear. And verse 48 says, When the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag and took out a stone and slung it and struck the Philistine on his forehead. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell on his face to the ground. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone and struck the Philistine and killed him. There was no sword in the hand of David. Then David ran and stood over the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of its sheath and killed him and cut off his head with it. When the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. And the men of Israel and Judah rose with a shout and pursued the Philistines as far as Gath and the gates of Ekron so that the wounded Philistines fell on the way to Sharem as far as Gath and Ekron. And the people of Israel came back from chasing the Philistines and they plundered their camp. We're not sure if Goliath had noticed the sling, but he certainly felt its impact As Goliath approached, David doesn't walk up gingerly. David runs towards him, pulls out a sling, and slung the stone and hit Goliath right on the forehead. The weight of his armor draws Goliath to fall flat on his face. And David runs up and takes out Goliath's own sword and cuts off his head. And unfortunately, the Philistines were not true to their word. They weren't like, oh, you guys won, okay. No, their champion was dead, but they did not concede defeat. But instead they ran, and the Israelites pursued, took many of them out, and plundered their camp. Now when you watch an action film, I think particularly for the men among us, but perhaps you ladies do too, we want to identify with the hero. We want to be the one who rushes into the burning building. We want to be the one who takes on the dragon We want to be the one who kills the giant. Which is why I think when many read the story of David and Goliath, they see themselves as him. They want to be the one who boldly stands up to the enemy and through God accomplishes great things. And that's an awesome thing to desire to be. But to do so, 
I think, misses the point of the passage. Ultimately, the story of David and Goliath is not about us and our enemies or the giants we may face. It's about Jesus and his. It may not feel as motivational, but we are not David in the story. Jesus is. We are more like the army of Israel, paralyzed with fear and unable to do anything in the face of death that comes for us all. It was the son of David, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who defeated our great enemy for us. We're not the hero of the story. It's him. But like David did, Jesus invites us to share in his victory and enjoy the benefits that he has secured. Ultimately, David and Goliath is a story about the gospel, a story that points to the saving power of the Lord and a story that could begin for you today to admit you are up against an enemy that you can not take down, but to confess him as Lord and to believe that God raised him from the dead, that he secured the victory for you and acknowledge your sin and invite his forgiveness and live not in your own strength, but in his. And it truly is good news. Because I, like I think many of us, I'm not a great fighter. I get scared. I can run. I can feel overwhelmed. In my heart of hearts, I'd love to always be the hero. But I know I never will be. I don't want that pressure on myself. I would gladly hitch my cart to Jesus' horse and let his work and power be the one I run behind. Do you? The good news is that Jesus' strength is in us who have called upon his name to be saved. The bad news means you will not get to be the hero. But we have one in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who saves. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray, God, that you would take the things that so many of us face, so many of the things that we are trying to amp ourselves up to deal with, And allow us to take a deep breath and rest in the perfect work of our Lord and Savior who 2,000 plus years ago said, it is finished. He conquered our greatest enemy and he has given us hope beyond the grave. May it be his victory we rest in and the hope he offers that gives us confidence. In Jesus' name, amen. Church, if you're able to stand together. I am safe on the 
And what incredible news for you, for me, that it is the Lord who saves. No matter what we're facing, no matter the circumstances that are in front of us, we are rescued and we are his. 
And therefore, because of that, no matter the circumstances, no matter what is going on, we can be, because Christ has the victory, we can be steadfast, we can be immovable, and always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that our labor is not in vain. And so because of that truth, let us leave here confidently, boldly and humbly in Christ that he has rescued us, he has invited us into the story, and there is a world that needs to know that salvation is found in Christ and Christ alone. So that's what we get to step into, and we can do so with such joy and confidence. If you are facing difficulties, if you are worried, scared, going through some, some things that have just been really, really heavy and hard for you, we're gonna have pastors and leaders up front as, as we always do. And as I, I say this most weekends, this idea, we'd love to pray with you, but we'd love to fix your eyes and your heart, not on us, but on Jesus, the one who saves. We'd love for you to grab your friends, those that are around you, create that environment of prayer for you to come and, and pray with each other right where you're at, knowing that he is faithful and he is the one who saves. No, we love you. If there's anything we can do, let us know. But receive these words as you prepare to go. And now to him who was able to keep you from stumbling and present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen and amen. Go in his grace and go in his peace.